Hey everybody, happy Tuesday. Welcome back to The Realignment. As you all know, we've been doing incredible coverage of Afghanistan. If you have not had the chance to listen to our episodes for retired General Dan Bolger or Professor Amy Chua, definitely go and listen to that right after this. But The Realignment, as Sagar will explain in a second, is a show that has a wide range of topics we focus on. We are not exclusively going to be a foreign policy podcast, no matter how much we and you enjoy discussing the topic. So for this week, we are basically doing Higher Education Week. This is the week where a lot of people, especially in our audience, are going back to college, whether they are high school seniors who are going into their junior or senior years. So there's a lot of people who are wondering what is going on in higher ed. So we're going to cover that today. Yeah. Shout out to some of the GW freshmen who I met on the street. Um, This one's for you. So this episode is with Jeffrey Salingo. He's a wide ranging author on all things college. We have links to many of his books, but more importantly, this episode is about this. What does the pandemic mean for college? Is this a lost generation? Why exactly were colleges able to do Zoom school and charge exactly the same amount of money? If you're looking for a wide ranging discussion around cost, tuition, culture, whenever it comes to college, work retraining programs, whether that's fake, whether it's real, and then actually where the future of higher education should go, this is the episode for you. Yeah, this is the episode that's really getting at what we're trying to do with the show, which is be a place where you could get your questions answered. And the number one question I'm having right now is, why is it that higher ed was supposed to completely change, but feels like it's the exact same? Plenty of great stuff here. Go check out the episode. And if you haven't already, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Let's get into the episode. Jeff Salingo, welcome to The Real End. It's great to be here. I want to start by asking a very basic question that is of direct relevance to basically everyone in the audience, whether they're a student, a parent, or someone paying off their student loan debt. From a conventional wisdom perspective, COVID was supposed to change everything about higher education. There are all these think pieces about how universities, because of the transition to Zoom, were going to have to accelerate much in the way that Zoom changed the workplace. You were going to see prices maybe have to change, universities would have to close. And at least from Sagar and my perspective, almost a decade out of college itself, it doesn't really feel like that much changed over the course of the year, unlike so many other areas of our lives. Is that take incorrect or correct? No, it's mostly correct. I think one of the interesting things, though, will be what we learned in higher ed over the last 18 months, whether we are going to see longer term changes come a couple of years from now or even a decade from now. I mean, change in higher education is incredibly slow uh, because these institutions have been around for for centuries in many cases. Right. So they don't turn on a dime like a a retailer might uh, or other sectors of the economy might just because of um, their their huge ships uh, that are run by alumni and faculty and students. And, uh, you know, governments are involved. Right. Creditors are involved. There's so many parties involved in this. It's really hard to change on a dime. But I do think that the aspects of the experience this past year, particularly when it comes to online education, are going to remain. The question is, is it a change we're going to see in six months or is it really a change we're going to see in six years? What was really fascinating, Jeff, is that there was this entire take in the early days of the pandemic, which is that this is going to kill higher ed forever, right? Like, this is it. You know, it's Zoom school. Really, is it all that different than signing up for like a MOOC online? And then it turns out that colleges didn't drop their char- their prices whatsoever, and literally everybody was still willing to pay it because it turns out that the experience wasn't as much as part of the bundle as the credential itself. Am I misreading that? Like, No, it's both was, the credential. Yeah. I think what, what's yeah. interesting to me about the failure to drop prices is that if you ask the typical student or typical parent when they're paying tuition, what, what are they paying for? They're actually paying for this bundled experience. But colleges in not discounting when they essentially move to Zoom are basically saying, most of our value and cost is caught up in the classroom, right? And we're still giving you classes. And I don't think most consumers see it that way. They see maybe the class is worth 50%, maybe even less. Right. And, and the rest of the experience, living in residence halls, eating in dining halls, going to sporting events, whatever it might be, that's the experience. And what's interesting to me is you when you talk to even people who work on college campuses and they say people want to get back to normal and they want to get back to campuses, well, they don't want to get back to classes on campus. They're actually more than happy to take online classes. What they want to get back to is all the other elements 
of the college experience, living with other people in residence halls, participating in the athletic teams, going to parties, going to clubs, just seeing people on campus, you know, the hands-on experience. So maybe from the academic side of things, you know, projects and research and things like that and internships, but sitting in a lecture hall and listening to a professor talk at you for 45 minutes, that is not Mm. what they're dying to get back to. Hmm. What does that point you just made mean for universities as they're thinking about how they conceive of their structure? So if there are a lot of people who aren't jazzed about that 400 person freshman year seminar, that's the definition of something that could be delivered online rather than in person. Does that online experience actually lead to a cheaper actual cost structure for the university? And if so, does it actually lead to a cheaper experience for students? I mean, if you talk to most college leaders, they say it will not um, lead to cheaper. I, I kind of disagree with that because there's a scale issue that you could, you know, scare, it's, there are seats are scarce at a lot, some universities, particularly more elite and top ranked universities. If you're able to offer more online, you could actually fit more students into a classroom rather than be constrained by the physical seats. So I think from a scale perspective, yes, you could save money. I think one of the failings right now of higher ed is that unlike the rest of the world, they're not seeing different segments of students, like uh, retailers might see different segments of customers, right? So they treat everybody the same, that everybody wants that residential face-to-face four-year experience. Well, some students do. Some students want a hybrid of that, right? They might want to intern in LA while taking online courses at their school in New York uh, because they want that internship experience, right? So thinking differently about just the way Home Depot might think differently about me or or the supermarket might think differently of me about, okay, I want to order my groceries online today and I want to have them delivered. Tomorrow, I want to order my groceries online and pick them up on uh, on the curbside. Uh, and the next day, by the way, I want to actually maybe make my list on your website, but come in and shop, right? There's all these different segments of customers, but in higher ed, we treat every student the same, essentially. So why did there not, why was there not like a bifurcation, so to speak? Um, something that Marshall and I were talking about is like, why did nobody say, okay, I'm going to dramatically cut my prices. I'm going to scoop up all of these people. I'm going to provide you a similar education experience with a, you know, semi subpar credential. It almost seems like everybody just decided we're going to keep our prices exactly the same and not go into that. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, well, and just one quick thing that I want to yeah. build on citing from the book, because Jeff, what I really enjoyed about who gets in and why is you were telling the story of Northeastern University. And what Northeastern did is it dramatically improved its rankings over the course of a generation through, for example, picking up better quality students, convincing a student who would be a great right. pick for a second tier to go to a third tier and you do that. And then you just move up that way. So it's easy to imagine a world where you say, hey, I'm a third tier university. What if I lower prices and pick up a bunch of second tier students and then just go on and on and on? Maybe the timeline here is too short, but that's just the thing I just add to Sagar's question then. Yeah, it's interesting because they all want to go in the opposite direction, right? So what did Northeastern do? Northeastern moved up the rankings by looking like other universities further up the pecking order. Um, And that's what, so rather than that third tier saying we're going to cut our prices dramatically to attract those second tier students, we're actually going to look more like the second tier, which by the way, usually costs more money uh, to try to attract those students. There's this idea of isomorphism, uh, institutional isomorphism in, uh, in higher ed, which is basically this idea. You have to look like everybody else. And particularly when it comes to the rankings, which are really kind of the profit motive in higher ed, right? We don't have profit in higher ed. So the rankings are really kind of our stock, you you know, stock price. And, uh, and, and the idea is, well, to look, um, to rank number 10, you have to look like number 10. And so you basically copy them. And that's the problem. That's why there is really no incentive to being cheaper, to looking different. You know, I tell this story all the time before the pandemic, when I would be on the road speaking a lot uh, and, and speaking at college campuses, I would, I would arrive on campus and the provost or the president or a dean would say, okay, we want to show you the most innovative thing happening on our campus uh, because they wanted me usually to write about it. And so we would go off to like some corner of campus, some deep department, you know, some one department deep in the bowels of some academic building. And they would show me this thing and they'd be like, this is the most innovative thing we're doing. And there'd be like 10 students there. And I said to them, well, this is, if this is so great, why are you only impacting 10? Why not 10,000 students? And they said, well, this is a little different and we don't want to look that much different 
than every other institution we're competing against. That to me is the biggest problem right now is this herd mentality in higher ed. And how do we shift people to think differently? Some schools are willing to do it, but I could count them on basically one hand. Can you name so, them? Like what are like what are the schools yeah, actually, that are doing yeah. different? So, uh, so I think places like Southern New Hampshire University, Arizona State University, where I'm a professor of practice and advise the president, and Georgia State University, and Paul Quinn College, uh, uh, which is you know kind of rethinking this urban work model. Right there, there are colleges like that that are usually led by very innovative presidents who are willing to take risks and been there a long time, by the way, who are willing to go in a different direction. But very few of them. So right now, millions of people are going back to college for the first time. I was telling Marshall, my girlfriend's sister, uh, told me a really crazy anecdote. She's a junior, and she has to go find her buildings because she doesn't know the campus. But she's a junior, so she hasn't spent any time on her own campus. And I was like, that's crazy. Like, And obviously, I'm not saying that's the biggest deal in the world. I'm using it as a proxy for... Well, I can't imagine that. I When I was a junior, I mean, obviously, and most juniors, you know the campus really well. You're almost like a veteran. You're, you're like, hey, I'm thinking about internships. Like, oh, my God, I'm going to graduate next year. What does this mean, the pandemic, based on your own reporting, like what you've seen for this current generation, which is in college? Do they feel cheapened by the experience? Is it a net you know, benefit? Is it an increase? negative. How are they thinking about it? How are the administrators thinking about it? And what's it look like for them? I mean, uh, from from an administrative standpoint, I think they think this is going to be a lost generation, right? There, there's mm-hmm. this idea, for example, during the Vietnam War, that those graduates who graduated around the Vietnam War have not been really that engaged with their alma mater. So I think they're thinking the same thing with these, you know, probably the class of 2020, 2021, 2022, you're never going to get them back for a union. You're never going to get any money from them. They did not get the experience that you promised them. So yeah. I think that's from the administrative side. I think the same thing is from the student side. I think they feel very cheated. And for those students who have the means and the flexibility, you're seeing them take time off. And they're basically saying, I'll wait this out and uh, I'll just come back and, and have that undergraduate experience I want to have in maybe a year or two. But for everybody else, they're kind of just kind of slogging through it. They're not happy about it. I don't think anyone's happy about it. I don't think parents are happy about it. I don't think students are happy about it. I, 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 I laugh at this idea that people will say, well, it'll make them more resilient it'll prepare them for a world of work where they might be um, where they might be uh, on, you know, online anyway. I mean, I don't think anybody who looks at those nice brochures or those nice websites that come in the mail or via email that promise you these, you know, nice quads with green grass and studying out there and enjoying the undergraduate life. I don't think anyone looks at that and now is getting the experience they're getting and saying, yes, this is worth it. Right. Something I'd like you to speak to is a comment you made earlier about how there's actually always different markets of higher education to serve. There are community students, there are people who are looking for non-traditional education, apprenticeships. You did a lot of good writing on this in the Washington Post. There are always different customers, but it seems as if at a narrative level, what you're suggesting is that universities are still in very direct competition to serve a very specific set of people. What is driving that and why does it feel as if there isn't as much of a real desire to look, to, to your point, you're saying everyone's trying to look the same, you could serve whole other markets by looking different in different ways. So can you just speak to that? Yeah. I mean, the biggest market, to be honest with you, is the adult student market. So there are, you know, every year, a couple million students who graduate from uh, high school, you know, not all of them go to college, maybe 80%. So we're talking really kind of a, a million and a half, two million, maybe a little over 2 million students every year for a couple thousand colleges out there. Meanwhile, there are tens of millions of adults who either didn't go to college, started college, didn't finish, or are adults who went to college who need more education. But yet a very small portion of the market is going after that market, right? So if I'm just thinking from this as a marketing perspective, if I'm in any other industry and you're looking at your the scope of that market, the total addressable market, why would you go after this small portion when you have this huge portion out there. And it's the, the answer, simple answer is it's easy, right? There is a pipeline from co- high school to college. Uh, we know where to find them. They usually take a test. We know how to buy their name. We know where to find them in high schools. It's just so much easier. And m- many of them want to go to college. So it's just so much easier to find that customer than it is that customer out there who maybe 
went to college and is now not really that happy because they had to drop out or never went to college. And so it's a little bit harder not only to find them, but to enroll them and to make them succeed. It's really around, that's to me is what it comes down to is just how hard it is to serve that other, these other segments of, of students for most colleges. What role does the government play in this, Jeff? I hear a very, you know, classic libertarian critique, which is that the uh, the student debt crisis is really a making of the government in terms of guaranteeing student loans um, and all of that. Obviously, state governments themselves also run many of these colleges. They, in, through their funding mechanisms itself, can set the prices and contribute to all of that. Could you break down some of that? Because there's a lot of, of rhetoric um, really on both sides surrounding this. Yeah, I mean, I think part of the problem is, is that we've really shifted the cost of higher education to students and families in general. I mean, back in the late 1960s, when the Higher Education Act was first passed, it really was a partnership between institutions, between governments, both state and federal, and um, and between students. And largely over, particularly over the last 30 years, that burden has really shifted to, to students. And, you know, there is this argument that uh, on one side, and Bill Bennett, the former education secretary under Ronald Reagan, really advanced this idea that the more federal money available, this Bennett hypothesis, as it was called, the more money available, the more colleges will charge. Now, that's a hypothesis that some economists have dismissed uh, over, over the years, but there's no denying that the ease of debt, and I think that's the problem, the ease of debt both for students and for families. I'm more worried about family debt right now. Mm -hmm. uh, parent plus loans, for example, uh, or plus loans also for graduate students. It's very easy to get that money to pay for a graduate degree if you're a graduate student and for parents to pay for their students to go to college. That If I were to start anywhere, I would basically really clamp down on that debt because then col that colleges would be forced to say, okay, student debt, uh, is regulated by the government, but this other debt is not. Uh, maybe we are charging too much, and we're going to be forced to uh, lower our prices. That's where I would start if I were if I were in charge. Can you explain what clamping down on the debt means? Because you were talking about graduate school, and then that's obviously separate from undergraduate. So can you yeah. talk about the different types of debt? that folks have, because this actually plays into the whole student loan forgiveness yep. debate where it actually gets yep. complicated, where when you think of student loan forgiveness, you think of a person who has all this debt from undergrad, but actually a lot of student loan debt is held by professionals. Yeah, I think more who, than 60% yeah. like of it or something like yeah, that. Yeah, so just talk about so just talk about student loans broadly. Yeah, so uh, so at the undergraduate level, uh, you could get what are called subsidized loans or unsubsidized federal loans, um, but there are limits on how much you could borrow from the federal government. Subsidized loans means basically that the interest is subsidized while you're in school, and those mostly go to lower income um, students. Uh, but at the graduate level, uh, you could basically borrow up to the cost of attendance, which includes basically every cost uh, under the sun, uh, if especially if you're going to an expensive graduate school or you're going to law school or business school. So that includes your living expenses. And most people do borrow up to that. There are no limits on that. And at the undergraduate level, uh, there is something called a Parent PLUS loan, which allows parents to borrow for their kids' education. And again, no limits on that either. And so what ends up happening is that when colleges send out a, at the undergraduate level, when they send out a uh, financial aid package, they might say, okay, there's these undergraduate loans, which are limited by the government. But by the way, you, you have a lot more need and we have to fill that in somehow. And then they offer these parent plus loans to parents and parents are like, okay, I guess I have to take this out in order to afford to send my kids to this school. Well, you don't have to. And that to me is where I would clamp down. I would actually really limit how much parents could borrow for undergraduate education. Now, on top of that, parents could always go to the private market and borrow in home equity or other loans. But of course, there's a lot of underwriting around that. And it's not easy to get those loans. So that's one thing I would do at the undergraduate level. And at the graduate level, I would also tie these loans to programs, right? We know some people go to for graduate degrees to get a job. They also go to undergraduate to get a job. But particularly, people are going to get a specific degree to get a job, whether that's a business degree, a law degree, or a certain master's degree. We also know how much more they make after college, after getting that graduate degree. And so we could start to tie how much they could borrow to how much they're going to make in terms of uh, their jobs afterwards. Un and, and, and that will then, I think, require colleges and universities to say, you know what, 
we can't charge $150,000 anymore for a degree in social work. I'm not saying a, degree, a master's degree in social work is not worth it, but you're not going to make enough money to pay off that loan over the long period. And that's what we're largely seeing at the graduate level right now in terms of loan debt. You know, it's interesting because the example you're giving, I don't think of the social work degree. I think of the reporting. I think it was in the Wall Street Journal about Columbia University's yeah, grad programs yeah, film. with film where you had folks yeah. spending, once again, you're in New York City, so you're getting a huge amount of loan debt beyond just the cost of the degree to make at best maybe 40, 42. So what you're suggesting is in the system you're advocating, Columbia would have to very clearly either eliminate these programs or seriously change the cost structure. Yep. But I guess on that note then, what are the purpose of those programs? Because something I've just heard rhetorically- To make is that money. A lot of, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so like what happens, so what, what, what actually, how would, because it's, it's actually just funny, like Sagar, I'm sure you've noticed this, but I just see so many top tier A plus branded colleges banding about these like really weird programs that I know aren't actually the thing. But we're oh, thinking yeah. like public policy school of plus. So yeah, you're buying a degree. You're essentially buying an elite degree. I went to school, GW, and I started seeing these ads for masters in political management. And like, I'll spare the uh, curse words, but like, what the, like, what, what are you talking about? That's literally fake. That's not a thing. Except though, Jeff, it's not fake because the employers on the Hill do take that stuff seriously and they probably will hire you because you have it if you're up against nine different people. So yeah, th right. That's because we don't problem? know the skills. What's up? Right. Do we have a cultural problem in that we value this these like fake degrees in the education market? Do we have a funding problem that starts with the debt itself? Or is everybody in the system basically complicit? No, well, everybody in the system is complicit, right? <laughs> uh, but we do, and employers are to blame here because they use, there's a signal noise problem here, right? So there's mm -hmm. too much noise in terms of people applying for jobs in, in a normal market. You really have no idea, do you have the skill sets, right? So what you do is you just look for the credentials and the more credentials somebody has or the more credentials they have from an elite school or the more credentials they have from when a specific degree you say, well, they must have these skills. Or I hired somebody from the school previously and they had these skills with this degree, so I'm going to hire somebody else with this degree, right? So we use the degree as a signal because we're not quite sure uh, for, about two things. What real skills are needed to do this job? We don't quite know that. Or from an employer's perspective, we're just overwhelmed with applications and it's a good sorting mechanism to basically say, okay, I'm just going to pick uh, the applicants out with this degree. Yeah, the way I usually describe this when talking of people who are overly optimistic about alternative models of education is basically none of you seem to have solved the HR problem in the sense that you're always going to have a system where you're going to put in your BA. If you don't have the BA, you're talking to screeners. We're not even talking about someone who could have a nuanced conversation about the nature of what you spent your 18 to 22 years doing. There's always going to be a gap there. So how, how, how have you seen people think about that specific, it, maybe it's not a problem, but that specific dynamic around just the fact that people see it as a baseline. Well, I think increasingly employers are starting to figure out, and I wrote about this in my last, my, the previous book too, uh, Who Gets In and Why, which was There Is Life After College, where I talked about how employers are hiring and increasingly they have data on their best employees who really survives and thrives at their firms uh, over the course of time. And they've reverse engineered those careers and they figured out like how they came in. What did they major in? Uh, what did they do in college? Where did they go to college? And employers who have done that and done that in a detailed way, I talk about the story of Credit Suisse in my, um, in my book, where they really looked at where they were hiring and, and, and the degrees they were hiring for and the skills that they're hiring for. Now, that's all fine and good. And so what they ended up doing was expanding who, where they search for uh, talent in terms of schools. They, they started basically going down the pecking order if you're thinking about the rankings. But then those students would get in for interviews and then human bias would come in. Well, you know, you went to a school I never heard of, so I'm going to ask you harder questions now mm -hmm. in the interview process. And those then those students never got in, um, even though they were, you know, in the interview pool. The, this so this is in terms of being complicit. This is just our our idea of 
uh, elitism in, in, in American higher ed that you must be good if you went to one of these top schools. And it really creates problems at the front end, as I talk about in, in uh, Who Gets In Why. It's why these schools are overwhelmed with applications, where other schools that I offer, by the way, a really good undergraduate experience, but just because they don't rank in the top X of whatever, they don't get as many applications. I was really fascinated by this Washington Post piece that you wrote, um, and I, I think we should stick it in the description. It's Harvard and its peers should be embarrassed about how few students that they educate, that their minuscule admissions rates are a sign of failure, not success. And I'm of two minds of this because I completely both agree with your thesis, but if I was a Harvard grad, I'd be like, whoa, 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 you can't let in more people. To like it, like well, yeah, you're like well, this is a this is a club. I mean, the four percent. I'm dining out on that for the rest of my life. Like you're actually cheapening it. I remember when I was a GW, there was this whole thing. I forget what exactly they did, but they like juked the stats on their science department, and they lost their USA Today ranking. And you would have thought that you had pulled the rug under from the egos of half of the student body population. I, I mean, and I, I remember also being mad. I was like, how can they do this to us? They dropped our rankings. So I get it from those who are within the system and already bought in. But I also, well, first of all, explain what you were trying to say in that piece, but maybe address on how when we have this kind of like prisoner's dilemma problem for everybody inside, how can you actually address that? So what I was addressing in that uh, piece is that uh, American higher ed has grown. America has grown. Um, and basically, these institutions are the same size as they were in 1979, uh, for the most part. And right. So you have more students graduating from high school, more students going to college. And these colleges essentially haven't expanded. I'm not talking about, by the way, that they go from, you know, a couple thousand to hundreds of thousands. We're talking about if they expanded their class, even by a little, and almost every admissions dean that I spent time with in reporting this book said, we could enroll academically the same highly qualified class eight times over. Uh, they have enough highly qualified applicants. So we're not going to diminish the incoming class. Uh, we're not going to diminish the overall school. Going back to your question about, hey, I was here. I, I don't want the brand diminished. You're, you could actually increase the size of these classes by a little without diminishing the brand. And that was really what I was calling for in that, um, in that piece uh, mm -hmm. at a time when more students are knocking on the doors of these elite colleges. You know, what's so interesting about that is you made the point at the start of the episode that these are giant ships. You're trying to turn the direction of the Titanic. I hope that's not too much of a metaphor here, but you know, you're trying to turn the Titanic and I'm kind of fortunate the Titanic sucks. So yeah, uh, so that, it, that might maybe, be the only problem with that. Yeah. That's an editorial <laughs> statement I'm putting out there, but <laughs> why, why are schools the size that they are? So for example, let's talk, look at Ivy's Cornell is huge. Yep. relative to They're the other outlier leagues, of the Ivy, right right yeah. Cornell's the uh, outlier I think Brown and Dartmouth are pretty small how why is it that schools these schools especially that the the mid tiers to ambitious schools are trying to look more and more like increasingly why do they look the way they look cuz I feel like answering that question goes to how can you actually change the conversation around expanding sizes cuz the last thing I'll add to this I think you point out in the book that Stanford actually added 100 slots in 2016 I believe so it's so it's not as if you don't see changes it's just that there's still small tactical changes in the context of this really big centuries long uh, strategy I mean, I think part of it is is just historical. We we tend to think, particularly in the U.S., that small size equals high quality, uh, and so we don't want to produce a lot of something. Um, and so I think that's part of it. I also think there's a uh, there's a belief that we have to replicate the experience over and over again, so that if we grow by 100 students, we have to replicate that same experience, which means we need to build more buildings and hire more faculty and things like that. I I think this is the lesson, perhaps, from COVID that online education can be used effectively, not fully online, but perhaps more courses online that would allow institutions to potentially enroll more students uh, as a result. So I think that that piece could change. I think what, what is hard to get over is this historical narrative, this cultural narrative that small size equals high quality. Hmm. Yeah, it's just so difficult, it seems, in order to conquer that. You know, I want to return to kind of like the pipeline and the cost 
and more because I do think it's very important and everybody seems to have a pet reason as to why it's really expensive. So if you were, you said, you know, to tackle the graduate debt, but you also said something which is important and kind of confirms a cynical view for a lot of people, which is that they're doing it to make money and yet they're not for-profit institutions. So what is the purpose of making money when you're a college? Now, now my parents work in uh, at Texas A&M. They're both you know, lifelong professors. So I have some familiarity with this, but it still is like a state university system. If you're Columbia University, what is the purpose of making more money? Is it to fund a department? Is it to hire more people? It's certainly not to educate more students. Like, what's why do I want more money if I'm the dean of Columbia? So- um, because even though these are nonprofit institutions, they all have surpluses every year. Um, mm-hmm. Well, maybe not during COVID, but they do operate with surpluses. At small colleges, they want to have that cushion. Uh, and then what they do with that surplus is, you know, they could put it into deferred maintenance or they might put it into financial aid. At bigger colleges, they will give raises to folks. and But they just do like to collect extra money, uh, even though they're, they're nonprofits. Some of it is out of fear that something like COVID could happen and, and they will need that money. But the other thing is they just build this into the budget to do other things with, uh, increase the endowment or whatever it might be. Um, there's never, it's always a case of more, wanting more in higher ed um, because the pursuit of knowledge is always ever growing, right? So we could create another department. We could hire more faculty. We could build another building. There's just a sense that we've always been getting bigger. We always have to get bigger. And bigger doesn't mean class size. Bigger means no. It doesn't mean class size. It just and that's means, the, and that's the interesting right. part of the dynamic. Um, more ma- right? More majors, more buildings. But it, you're right. It doesn't mean more students necessarily. Hmm. So, I want to just in our last bits here, just go through. I don't want to say hot button because it's higher education, so it's not exactly the most clickbaity space there is, but these are the issues that people are probably thinking about at this point. So I would just love to hear, we kind of got this, but I would love to hear just your perspective on student loan forgiveness to like the center left to left part of our audience. This is a very contentious issue. It seems to be one of those areas where Joe Biden has a Joe Biden blocker on, which causes controversy with rising parts of the Democratic Party. How do you think of the issue of student loan forgiveness? Well, I'm going to probably be very Gen Xer here, uh, which I am. (laughs) Uh, I'm not a big fan of it. I I think that uh, with limited, using it in a limited way, um, to particularly help uh, students who I think were probably misled, um, which they're using now, right? Uh, a lot of the for-profit colleges and universities that are getting their loans uh, forgiven. Uh, I think that students with maybe some excessive debt uh, that, again, were misled, I think we could use it there. But blanket loan forgiveness, I do not agree with. I'd rather us put that money towards um, trying to build a better system for the future. That goes back to what I was saying earlier around limiting loans. Uh, I would rather try to invest in higher ed in general, especially institutions that have great outcomes, but don't have huge endowments. That's where I would put my money. Um, I do think that um, students have always had skin in the game uh, going back to the late 1960s. um, And I think they should continue to have skin in the game. My problem is, is that too, too many have too much of it in, right? They, they, they've they just overburdened uh, themselves with loan debt. And I think a little bit that's on, of on, that's on them, uh, a lot of it's on us. And if we could figure that out, uh, that's where we should be focused on our, on our forgiveness. One thing that you rhetorically hear all the time is, let's take dollars away from the colleges and let's put it towards like uh, worker retraining programs and apprenticeships. And like, it sounds good in theory, um, but you've actually written about how worker retraining programs, a lot of them don't work. Um, So whenever we say, well, first of all, what's wrong with worker retraining programs? Is it more of a rhetorical thing politicians can point to than an actually an efficacious policy? And second, if we were to redesign an education system, which will actually work in order to equip people with skills that's going to dramatically or not dramatically, but increase their wages overall in the lifetime, what would that actually look like? So in terms of worker retraining, I, I think part of the problem is that most of the worker retrain, uh, retraining that needs to be done is um, is more short term, right? And so I think we we go in 
when there's massive layoffs, for example, and we think that, oh, let's get them a community college degree or a two-year degree or a four-year degree, when many of these people either didn't go to college, uh, dropped out of college or went to college 25 years ago, and to expect them to get a full degree at, uh, when they're time-pressed often and location-bound, uh, I think is just unreasonable. And it's really not what the workplace needs this day, these days, right? They need, they need a job tomorrow, and they may need two or three skills that don't require a four-year degree. So that's where I would redesign it is, what are the needs of the job market? What are the skills people have? What are they missing? Let's get them those missing skills and get them to move on. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the education system overall, we could probably do an entire show on that in <laughs> a year of shows on that. Uh, uh, I, I think that we just need more pathways from high school and we need to fund those pathways, right? Not everybody wants to be um, not everybody wants to have, uh, you know, go to a four-year college. People want apprenticeships. People want to take years off to try to figure what they want. But the problem is our entire funding system is built around the four-year college. So we need to do a lot more career exploration in high school because I don't think most people know what careers are, what jobs exist. And then I think we need to fund them equally so that a student who's coming out of high school could go and get job training. They could go to get a two-year degree. They could go get a four-year degree. They could take a national service. They could do, they have more options than basically the three we have now, which is graduate from high school and do nothing. Uh, maybe get a job, but you're not going to get a very good job without a, without a college diploma. You go into the military, which is a declining option for others, or you go to college. I mean, that's really what we have. Um, and to be honest with you, when we have 2 million students graduating high school every year, it seems like that's not, uh, you know, that's not enough pathways for what we need. Mm -hmm. I want to re-ask the student loan question, but at a more philosophical level. One of the biggest innovations in education, obviously, was transitioning the country towards a system where people didn't stop their educations in eighth grade. They actually got high school educated. This is in the first part of the 20th century. Something you see from folks today is they say, hey, look, just like the world of the 1920s and 1930s required a populace who was educated at the high school level, the world of the 21st century requires a populace that's educated with college. Um, given that argument, we should also pay for college in the way that we don't describe high school as just free high school. We should think of college education as a public good. So what is your response to that more philosophical version of the student loan and cost of college argument? I mean, I think part of the issue is that we have turned, because of the cost of college, we have turned it into essentially trade school. Uh, and, and we see this in the majors, right? When you look at what students are majoring in, they're majoring in STEM fields, business, you know, uh, health health professions. They're, they're majoring in things that they think will provide them jobs. And they're ditching the humanities in huge numbers, huge numbers. And because, and when you ask people, well, why? And you're like, well, that leads to a job. And well, why are you so focused on getting a job is because higher education is so expensive. I think that if we not only reduce the cost of higher education, but we reduce the amount of debt people have to take on, then you're going to use college for what I think it, its purpose is partially to explore and try to figure out what you want to do, partially to get broadly educated because you're going to need to be educated for the rest of your life, and partially to get specific skill sets for a job afterwards. The problem is that most of what we're doing now is going into that last bucket to get specific job skills, and I'm not even quite sure they're really getting them all the time at every college to get that job. Jeff, what do you think about these affirmative action cases um, in California, Texas, and more. And then also, obviously, the most hot button one, which is Harvard and, you know, alleged discrimination around Asians. I mean, you can see on the one hand, you know, they're making these same arguments that they made back in, you know, the early 1900s about, oh, we're trying to preserve the integrity of the school. At the other hand, you know, it is a private institution and the courts are getting involved. This has become one of the most hot button topics in all of higher education. I'm curious for your perspective just on the entire thing. Yeah, I mean, these cases just come up every, uh, every t uh, 10, 20 years. Actually, it seems like every five now, uh, largely because of what we were talking about earlier, the scarcity of seats. And so mm -hmm. 
Uh, everybody wants to go to these top colleges. There's fewer seats for them. And, um, and colleges are trying to diversify like they should. Um, and there's just fewer seats. I actually think there would be less pressure and fewer lawsuits as a result in affirmative action if we increase the size of these classes. Does it answer everything? No, but it really takes the pressure off. When you think about, and if you read the book, you know I talk about kind of crafting this class it requires you to accept athletes. It requires you to accept, you know, artists. It requires you to accept legacies. It requires you to have enough majors across all the majors you offer, right? Pretty soon you're left with no seats. Um, and that's the problem that we're, we're facing here with many of these affirmative action lawsuits. Hmm. You know, that's just a fascinating way of putting it because if you actually look at the good faith version of the critique and something you also do in the book is you really differentiate what the modern Asia Pacific Islander um, focused cases. So it's not about this one individual student who oftentimes has their own weirdness or mediocrities, which make the case more about them than the actual idea. The case today is really, no, look, like there's this whole set of people um, in, the, in the metaphor that they're often using, Asians are the new Jews. Therefore, there's this whole set of people, but it's not getting accepted. So I really take your point about how the issue seems to actually be, there just aren't enough spots relative to how many qualified people there are, and that there actually seems of those qualified people, there's a disproportionate number of those persons who are Asian. So they, there's this real scarcity issue here. Like what, you know, you, you in the book and just through your general career, you've spoken to um, administrators at the higher education level. Obviously they are not going to literally say that they see their institution as a nightclub. They're not gonna give too unspecific an argument around the institution's brand. Like, what is their actual response to why can't you just increase this place 200 to 500 people? What could, when, 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 if you actually look through most of the issues we're actually describing, that would at least start at addressing a bunch of them. Yep. Uh, they just don't think it's important. Um, and they don't want to, they don't want to, they don't think the pressure is happening internally. Uh, they like the selectivity that they have. Uh, and they, they, there's just not enough pressure on them. Um, the only people that I think could put pressure on them is the government, uh, because the government holds a big purse strings in terms of research dollars, in terms of financial aid dollars at these institutions. I think that the, if the government kind of rethought how they give out financial aid, and there was, it was more incentive based for the institutions to change their behavior, whether that's around cost, whether that's around access whether that's around the programs you want them to offer, whatever it might, whether it's around outcomes. You know, if you're not, gra if you're not graduating 50% of your students, you're not getting any more federal financial aid, whatever it might be. We could start to craft programs that I think have what we want them to achieve by just basically saying, you're not going to get the money anymore. Jeff, what are some of, there's some been a lot of, you know, kind of doom and gloom here. What are some of the hopeful stories in higher education today? You pointed out some of the, uh, the specific universities you think are innovating, but you know, maybe just describe some of the programs, what people are doing. If you have hope for change in the system, where should you look right now? Yeah, I, so I have hope. Uh, Georgia Tech, for example, a, a graduate degree in computer science that's online that's eight thousand dollars, right? And it has actually increased the number of students getting uh, advanced degrees in in, in computer science. Uh, Western Governors University and this idea of competency based education, which is also being done at a number of other universities. In other words, if you're you already know the information. You don't have to sit in a class and take it. You can just continue on and learn what you, know, you spend time on what you don't know. Uh, there are institutions like Rio Salado College in Arizona where you can start basically on any Monday. Uh, you don't have to wait until the end of the of the semester. There's mm -hmm. Arizona State University, which offers you know hybrid courses uh, that you can mix and match with face to face courses, so that it's a much more flexible option. Uh, for you. So there are institutions out there that are really, I'm really hopeful about. Uh, Georgia State, let me just give one other example, using data to figure out um, how students are learning so that we could basically make sure that we don't wait for students to come to us to say that they're having problems, but we could see in advance that they're running into problems in these classes. What is that about? Why? Maybe we need to redesign the class. Maybe we re need to redesign the degree, whatever it might be. Those are institutions that I think are being more assertive, more aggressive, more student-centered at the end of the day, rather than designing institutions like we always have had around largely the faculty. You know, an obvious thing that is a real shift from Sagar and my cultural experience around college, not just as we were applying, but as we conceived of the process is the SAT and the ACT. 
Um, can you talk about the changes when it's come to schools saying it's now optional, increasing pushes around the broader narrative there? How, where, where does that whole debate and perspectives really stand? Um, so you are going to see, you had about 600 colleges and universities go test optional during the pandemic because students largely couldn't take the test. Uh, you are going to see probably about half of them, I bet you, come back. Uh, largely state universities that use the test as a sorting mechanism because they get too many applications. The Ivy Leagues and other elites who say, you know what, we need a test score because we just need a test score. I don't buy that argument, but whatever. Uh, and then, so I think then the rest though will continue to be uh, test optional because they see that they could uh, still enroll a class that is highly qualified and uh, and they could take away the test. I, I mean, I like this mainly because I didn't do great on the SAT. I'm not a good <laughs> test taker. Uh, so, and again, this is a perspective, I think, of almost everything we're talking about. I'm sure I'll have some listeners write to me and say, Why, how can you not say there's a test or how can you not say affirmative action's bad or whatever it might be? Because you want to know why wherever we're sitting, we define merit in higher education by what's important to us, right? So if we're really good test takers, we're going to say, you know what we count for most in admissions? Test scores. If, we're really, if we have a really good uh, GPA, we're going to say GPA should matter, right? Uh, if we believe that, um, uh, you know, we believe that, you know, a legacy should matter, we're going to say that should matter most, right? Wherever we sit, we cannot come to terms with this word merit and what it really means. You know, everybody thinks that higher education is this meritocracy and it isn't. It never has been, it never will be. There's unfairness in the system, largely because it's human-based. Um, and that is the point I think that I really try to get through in the book is that it's not a fair system. Go into admissions knowing that and expand your field of view. There are more than 10 schools out there. There are more than 20 schools out there. There are even more than good a couple good hundred schools out there. Think about it more broadly. There's plenty of schools out there that want you, um, and that's really where you should be focused. So here's my last big question. I really like it when we have authors on who in the past have written very point of view holding books. So around six or seven years ago, you wrote a book called College Unbound about the future of higher education with almost half a decade's time to reflect. What did you get right and what did you get wrong <laughs> given everything that happened over the past 18 months? Um, what did I get wrong? I, I, I probably felt that the, um, that the pace of change was going to be a lot faster back in 2012. This was, you know, post 2013 is when the book came out. It was right after the MOOC movement, you know, massive online open courses, online courses, I thought would take off a little faster than they did. Um, and the pandemic I think has accelerated that. So I, I definitely got that wrong. Um, uh, I thought that, uh, more schools would go out of business. Um, and I got that wrong, right? There have been an increase in schools going out of business, but not as, as many as I thought back then. But what I did get right, I believe, is this idea of flexibility uh, and that students want more flexibility. Institutions that are doing well are offering that, whether it's the uh, competency-based uh, education that I was describing earlier with Western governors or the hybrid education offered by ASU. That has moved much more quickly than I even expected back in 2013. Hmm. Well, Jeff, this has been a really enlightening conversation. Uh, we're going to have links uh, to your book to our, in our bookshop um, elsewhere. Do you have anywhere that you would like to point to people towards? Yeah, the best place is to come to my website, jeffsalingo.com. You could sign up for my newsletter called Next, which comes out every other week. You could sign up for our podcast, our podcast, Future You, which I co-host with my uh, good friend, Michael Horn, where we talk about a lot of these issues. So best place to come, jeffsalingo.com. Awesome. Go ahead and subscribe there, everybody. Go ahead and check all of this stuff out. Thanks for joining us, man. Really appreciate it. No problem. You. It was great to be with you. Thank you.